Meet today's modern automobile. Combining the raw power of an internal combustion engine with all the control, precision, and safety that engineers can develop. Today's automobiles travel along at speeds unimaginable just a short time ago. So what has been responsible for this leap forward in technology, you ask? Well, the answer lies in friction. Why, without friction between the tires and the road, an automobile could not speed up, slow down, or even drive around a corner. To see just how friction plays such an important role in modern motoring, let's take a closer look at friction itself. Friction is defined as the surface resistance to relative motion between adjacent bodies directly proportional to the normal force between them. Now that's one mouthful. Perhaps taking a closer look at the equation for friction will help. Here we see how the force of friction relates to the normal force. What's that squiggly letter in there, you ask? Why, that's the Greek letter mu. It represents the coefficient of friction. The coefficient of friction relates the magnitude of the normal force to the magnitude of the friction force. Taking a closer look at this wheel, we can see the normal force by the road on the tire. When the driver of the car hits the brakes, the wheel resists turning, thus producing a rearward friction force between the tires and the road, bringing the car safely to a stop. By increasing the normal force on the wheel, the magnitude of friction generated between the tires and the road can be increased, resulting in better control of the vehicle. Conversely, if the driver presses the accelerator, the tires will try to turn faster, thus producing a friction force forward on the car, causing it to speed up. Now every responsible driver knows that they have greater control over their automobile when traveling along a dry road than they do when on a snowy road. This is because automobile tires produce more friction against dry asphalt than they produce against a snowy road. Going back to the equation for friction, the coefficient of friction between tires and the road varies with the conditions of the road. Anytime two materials make contact, they have a coefficient of friction between them, and that coefficient's value is specific to those particular materials. When looking at this table of coefficients of friction, you'll note that automobile tires have a much higher coefficient of friction against a dry road than they do against a snowy one. A higher coefficient of friction means more friction can be produced for a given normal force. Notice the coefficient of friction has no units as both friction force and normal force are measured in newtons. Friction can be further broken down into two separate types of friction. First, we have static friction. Static friction is a force which acts between two objects which have no relative motion against each other. In short, friction exists when two objects are not sliding against each other. Like when leisurely driving your car down the road. Next, there's kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is a friction force which acts between two objects that are moving relative to each other. Kinetic friction occurs when two objects slide against each other, like when skidding your vehicle to a stop. Regardless of the type of friction that comes into play in a problem or situation, the equation for friction still applies. That coefficient of friction can either be specific to static or kinetic friction. It is important to note, static friction is always greater than kinetic friction. So be careful not to spin those car tires. There's less friction if you do. To understand friction a little bit better, let's take a look at Horace here in his brand new state-of-the-art racing automobile. In this example, we will calculate the stopping distance of the car when Horace applies full brakes to the moving vehicle. If the road is dry and Horace presses the brakes hard enough, the wheels of the car will lock up, producing kinetic friction against the road, and the car will skid to a stop. In this problem, just like others, we're gonna say up and to the right are positive. The total mass of the car is 1,000 kilograms. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the tires and the road is 0.8. And this car is initially traveling at 20 meters per second. So to find the stopping distance of the car, first we need to draw a free body diagram showing all the forces acting on the car. Then we'll be able to solve for the acceleration, finally the stopping distance. First we have the force by gravity. The force by gravity equals mg, so the total weight of the car is 9,800 newtons. Next we have the normal force by the ground acting upward on the car. And finally there's friction acting backwards to slow the car down. Applying Newton's law on the y-axis, we can see that the sum of all forces has to equal zero, otherwise the car would take off like a rocket. So the normal force minus the weight must equal zero. This means the normal force is 9,800 newtons upward. We know friction is equal to mu Fn. 
So friction will equal 0.8 times the normal force, which is 9,800 newtons. This gives a friction force of 7,840 newtons. Next, we apply Newton's second law in the x-axis. Because friction is the only force acting horizontally on the vehicle horizontally, friction will equal the mass times acceleration in the x-axis. Realize, friction is backwards. So when we plug this into Newton's second law, we need to make sure we show friction as being a negative value. In solving for the horizontal acceleration, we find the car is accelerating at 7.84 meters per second squared backwards. Having found the horizontal acceleration of the car, we'll now plug that acceleration into the kinematic equations to solve for the total stopping distance of the vehicle. And we find the total stopping distance of the car is 25.5 meters. This is a good stopping distance, but is it possible to do better? This time around, let's see what would happen if old Horace here presses on the brakes carefully and makes sure that the wheels of the car don't lock up. See, if the wheels of the car don't lock up, that means the tires against the road are going to maintain static friction rather than skidding, producing kinetic friction. And remember, static friction is greater than kinetic friction. So in this case, we're gonna go through and say the coefficient of static friction is 1.0. And we're gonna now work out the new stopping distance of the car. Now the force by gravity and the normal force on the car, those are gonna remain unchanged. Our equation for friction is still equal to mu Fn. It's just now the value for mu is instead the coefficient of static friction, that's 1.0. So the new friction force is 9,800 newtons. With a new greater friction force, we can now solve for the new stopping distance of the car. First using Newton's second law to solve for acceleration. And then the kinematic equations to solve for the actual stopping distance of the car. And what we find is the stopping distance of the car is now 20.4 meters instead of the 25.5 from before. That means if Horace can keep from locking up the wheels, the car will stop at a shorter distance. This improvement in braking distance is what's led to technologies such as anti-lock brakes, which prevent the car tires from ever locking up, thus maintaining static friction against the road. Now let's take a look at what happens to this stopping distance. If Horace tries to drive this car down a snowy road where the coefficient of friction is only 0.2, this time around, we find the car tires are only producing 1,960 newtons of friction against the road. That's much less than on a nice dry road. Plugging that friction value into Newton's second law, and then the kinematic equations, we find the total stopping distance of the vehicle is now 102 meters. What we're gonna do now is solve for the coefficient of friction required between the tires and the road for the car to drive up the hill at a constant speed. Now remember, this is a 1,000 kilogram car, and we're gonna say up the hill is positive. To start, we'll draw the free body diagram of this car on a hill. Starting with gravity, which is straight down, we know the weight of the car is gonna work out to be 9,800 newtons. The next force we show is the normal force. Remember, the normal force is always perpendicular to the surface an object is against. So in this case, that's gonna be perpendicular to the hill. That means the normal force is up and to the left. Now remember, the normal force and the force by gravity combine to be what we call the force down the hill. Lastly, we have the friction between the tires and the road. Now in this case, it's that friction between the tires and the road, or traction, that's actually pulling the car up the road. Remember, Friction doesn't always just slow things down. Now we're gonna take a look at the sum of all forces not in the X or Y axis, but in the plane of the hill. We know the friction force is uphill in the positive direction, and downhill we have the force down the hill. Remember, there's not really a force down the hill. It's simply Fn and Fg combine. Now remember, these two forces are gonna to combine to equal zero. We say it's zero because the car has no acceleration. We want this car to go at a constant speed up the hill. 
In doing a little math, we find that the friction force is equal to the force down the hill. Remember the force down the hill is mg sine theta. If you want to see how to derive the force down the hill, click up in the corner. And we find that the friction between the tires and the road required for the car to drive up the hill at a constant speed is 174 newtons. Now remember, we're not looking for the magnitude of friction in this problem. We're looking for the coefficient of friction. So we're gonna to need to take a look at our friction equation. Now the normal force we need to solve for using the equation mg cosine theta. If you wanna see where that's derived, click in the upper right hand corner. Having already solved for the magnitude of friction needed to drive the car up the hill, 174 newtons, we set that equal to mu fn. Plugging in our values for fn, we find that mu equals 0.18. Horse should be able to drive up this hill on anything other than an extremely snowy day.